Without further ado, I want us to give the biggest applause we can to our pastors, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa Garcia. Let's hear it for them, church. Let's hear it for them. Come on. Yeah. We're going to take this time to answer a few questions to get to know a little bit more. So why don't you guys go ahead and take your seat and we're going to jump right in. Here we go. Welcome, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa. Everyone is so excited and ready to learn today. But some of us know a little bit about your story and some of us may not know so much. So I want you guys to tell us a little bit about yourselves. When did you guys meet? How long have you guys been married? And just tell us a little bit. Okay. All right. So we've been married 33 and a half years. And actually, I met, I met Pastor Marco on, at a Bible study the day that I got saved. And his mom was preaching. Wow. Yeah. And it was, it, it was interesting because the Bible study was not at church. Uh, and Home actually, it wasn't Ooh. people that even went to our church. But we were, we were invited to this Bible study. And it was a Saturday. And I decided, okay, I'll go. And, and my, because my mom was doing the Bible study. And then she decided, I'll go. And we ended up meeting there. And I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> the rest is history, the folks. The rest is history, yeah. <laughs> well, we're so excited. And we got some more questions for you. Yes. What's one thing? I know there might be many. And there will be many. But what's one thing that you love about your spouse? OK, I'll go first. Um, besides this very handsome man that I love, I love Thank that you. about him. <laughs> um, one of, the, one of the things that really attracted me to him and still does and was from the beginning when I first met him is that I was just so attracted to how he knew the word of God. It was in him and he could just speak it like fluent, like if he was speaking another language fluently, but he, he knew the word of God and, and that's what originally attracted to me to him and he still does, still does. Awesome. You know, thank you, Lisa. That <laughs> makes me blush. Uh, Lisa, what I love about her is her emotional consistency. Um, she's actually not, doesn't go up and down. She's really consistent. And, and the question, what do you like uh, or about your spouse, is a really great question. Because after we're married for a while, if you... If you don't process through difficulties, it's difficult to see what you like about your spouse. Some of us in this room, if I ask you that question or you were asked that question, it would be a lot of thought because of something that happened. And, be, and when you become bitter and you become hurt and you don't process through that properly, this is what it bl does. It blinds you to the good in your spouse. And if right now you're thinking, I can't see anything good in my spouse, the reality was you married them, and there was a time you saw something good in them. Right. What happened? And what happened was something happened, and you never really processed through that. You never really forgave them. So all that was left is I can't see anything good. Yeah. But what I, but I love Alisa's, and, and it's all two-edged sword. I, I love that she's emotion, I mean, emotionally stable. I read something the other day that men usually speak around 15,000 words a day, and women speak around 30,000 words a day. Oh, that's double. Like double. In our home, I'm the 30,000, and she's the 15K. And when we go out to dinner once in a while, we'll just, this is Lisa. I go, what's going on? Nothing. And that's the conversation. Uh, and that's just the way, that's her makeup. But at the same time, it's, that's what keeps her emotionally stable. Like she's not up and down. And there's times that I want to just celebrate. And I want some excitement. I go, how was it? And she goes, it's good. <laughs> Woo, it's great. Uh, that, see, that's good. That's what I want right there. We're learning already. <laughs> that's so good. Um, we, another question I think is, is a good question is, we're going to learn about this all four weeks, but what's one principle you can say that is giving your marriage success? 
Okay, um, I, I mean, there's obviously a few, but I want to mention one today, and um, the Bible talks about in Ephesians, talks about that the man is the head of the home, and the wife is the helpmate, and so for wives, how many wives do we have out there? I always like it, I always like it because the girls go, woo! <laughs> See, I have emotions. Anyway. That's what we want at home, let's try not to <laughs> So, you may not like this word, though, um, uh -oh. submit. That is something that, that is a, pr a key principle in my life because I'm a wife and I want to be in God's order and in God's will. And I, as a wife, need to submit to my husband. He is the head of the home. When you do that, ladies, it's God's order. It's God's way and it works works right yeah and and i would say to guys uh work on on your leadership so you make it easier for your wife to follow that's good. that's good and and you become a greater leader when you're a greater follower of jesus uh there's a statement that paul said follow me as i follow christ and that's the idea the better we follow Christ's instructions, the Word of God. And when we're talking about the Word of God, this might be your first time hearing about the Word of God, but the Word of God, the Bible, is an instruction manual for life. And anybody that teaches success principles, whether it comes to relationships or finances or, or, uh, or forgiveness or anything that has to do with success in life, the principles are found in the Bible. That's true. And the better I follow those instructions, I, I learn them, and then I live by them, this is what happens. My life becomes more successful. And so leadership starts, and we've covered this about leadership. Great leadership starts in the home with personal leadership. And the more I allow myself to be led by the scriptures, the easier it is for my wife to follow. But if your husband is not there, ladies, you, you follow and you allow God to lead still through your husband. And understand this, as you're trusting God, God's going to take care of you. And your job is not to take, make sure the results work out. Just follow God's instructions. So and at the end, it will work out for you. And I'll tell you this, yes. anything Lisa wants, she gets. Oh. <laughs> it's just like she's won me over. And I'll, I'll say this, as a guy, there's nothing more attractive to a guy than a woman that's submissive. It's good. Woo. Come on, clap for that. Where the guys, great. come on, say amen, guys. Amen, amen. So, Pastor, this is um, Marriage Challenge 2023. We're finally here. For some, this is our first marriage challenge. Uh, others may be coming back. Some people maybe are have had a great long marriage. Others um, need to work it out a little bit. But I want to ask you to, or ask you, Pastor Marco, what's the goal? for these next 30 days? What's the goal of Marriage Challenge? Okay, so we're gonna work on relationship and relationship skill for 30 days. And, and some of us have a good marriage and the goal would be that you end up with a better marriage or a great marriage at the end of 30 days. Uh, every one of us are gonna learn and how, and then we're gonna apply. And that means that every one of us have some room to grow. So say it with me, grow. grow. Now the word grow means change. And we're not here to, to actually change our spouse. We're here to change ourselves. And for singles, uh, this, is what I, this is what you're doing. You're preparing yourself for opportunities that are coming up. So th there's going to be doors of opportunities to enter into relationships as you're prepared. And this is eventually what you'll attract. You'll attract who you are. So stop looking for the right person and become the right person. And when you're the right person, you'll attract the right person. That's so good. That's so good. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to do something very cool right now. We have some questions in the audience that Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa have not heard yet. They haven't heard, so we're going to get some raw answers. We did this session number one this morning at 9 a.m., and th again, these are some great questions and some great answers. So I'm going to go ahead and take it over to Pastor Armando, who's right awesome. over here in the audience, and he has a question right Hey, now. Pastor, we're here with Melissa. Melissa, what's your question for Pastor Marco and Lisa today? So uh, we know that the word says wives respect your husbands, husband loves your wives. So I'd be interested in hearing from a man's perspective 
practical ways that wives can respect their husbands, and then from a woman's perspective, practical ways that men can love their wives? Great question. Great question, Melissa. Wow. Okay. Practical way, honor and respect your husband, love him. Don't nag. Very practical. Don't nag. Don't be a nag. Don't com be a complainer and a nagger, one that is constantly nagging and do this and do that and you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you and you and you and you. Don't do that. And, and I would say, just to piggyback on that, don't compare your husband to another guy. That's so good, so good. It's very important that you begin to appreciate what you do have. And if there's one, if there's just even one quality that's great, keep mentioning that Focus quality that. Yes. and feed his ego. Yes. There's one thing a guy wants to know, and, and I'll tell you this, I, I, I could have the whole world against me. I'm good with that. I could fight the whole world, but I want to come home to a teammate. So it's really important for me to have my, my greatest supporter in my home. And, and ladies, you could do that, and that's, that's a practical way. Um, loving, loving my wife. Is that what you said? Next one? How, how do you love your wife? Uh, loving, loving my wife is laying down my preferences for her. I, get, I need to be aware. I need to be aware. One of the greatest ways I could love my wife is through the words I use over her. And I think what happens with most men, most men are, are, are short, and when I mean not short in stature, <laughs> what I mean is short in temperament. And that means we could be edgy, we could be quick, and, 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 and I need to know my wife, know who she is, get to know her, and part of it is just listening. Listening, just, okay, honey? Yeah, because guys are Mr. Fix-It. They want to listen to fix, listen to give you an answer. So that's, that's good. And, and I, I think the other way I could love my wife is, is by being, as me, as I, I could be a spiritual leader. Yeah, and I could say, really baby, good. you're in a safe place. I'm going to take care of you. And I tell her, and I could tell her, I love you. And I, practically, I tell her, I love you. And I, I tell her, I love you all the time. And guys, sometimes we don't say it. And women need to hear it. And you'll be saying, well, she ought to know I love her. I go to work every day. She ought to know I love her. I'm here. But it's more than that. I, I tell Lisa, I love you. And I tell her she's beautiful all the time. And it's good for me. And it's really good for her. And, but also serving serving and whatever way that you could actually sacrifice and serve for your wife and, and if it's a sacrifice it's love and for me one, one of the ways I sacrifice is taking out the trash <laughs> that's true that's a practical way there you go all right let's go let's hear from question number two Ruben we got a question over here all right we have Josh right here and he has a question good morning uh just a quick question I wanted to ask what or how or what can I do to honor my wife more Okay, I'll answer that. <laughs> what can you do to honor your wife for, for? This is what I would do. First, I wouldn't be guessing. I would ask her, what can I do <laughs> to honor you more? That's where you start. And, 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 I, and she might at the beginning not, not peg it, but that's the, be, that's the beginning of the conversation. Say, honey, I really want to honor you more. What can I do? to honor you more. I know you're busy. Be understanding with her. Um, also, uh, appreciate what she does. Say it. Honey, I just appreciate that you keep the house clean. I love it. Thank you so much. And, and, and just start saying that, appreciating her, asking her what, it, what, can, what can I do to honor her, her. But I would also say this. The greatest way that you could honor her, and, and I'll go back to this, be a man of God. Honor God. And if you honor God and she could trust you as a man of God, that's the greatest honor and that's respect really that you could give her. That's really good. And also, be, if you have children, be there for the kids. When you, as, a, as a woman, um, when you really love her kids, you're really showing love to her too. 
Great answer. Awesome. We have one more, Chris, Pastor right. Christian. Mason, go ahead and stand up. They've been married a year and a half, he said, so he's excited about that. Congratulations. So my question is, how can I communicate my like, feelings and emotions with my wife better instead of just like pushing them down and bottling them up? Great question. Okay, very good. So you want to be able to communicate with your wife better. I think what you're going to have to do is set some time aside to that because it's not going to naturally happen. It might be a little awkward at the beginning, but, but I think you need to talk. You need to begin to express your emotions. And you could have a date night, and part of that date night is not arguing. It's just saying, hey, honey, um, tell me how you're feeling. Uh, and, and she could say, well, this is how I'm feeling. Um, how do you think the relationship's going? Is there anything that I can improve on? And you start talking about those things, hearing it, and, and as you begin to open up a little, little by little, this is what's going to happen. The conversation is going to become more natural. And I think what we have as guys, we're just not used to, like, talking about our emotions. So, so that, you know, I, I get that. We're not girls. And it's not like we want to sit there and talk about our emotions all the time. But the, but the idea is, if you're feeling something, she should be able to tell you. And then you should be able to tell her. Say, honey, I, I just feel like... I feel like sometimes I, I, I feel like you don't love me. So why would you say that? Well, um, I feel like you're pushing me away at times. I, I feel like you're spending more time with the kids than me. I want some time. It's okay to talk about that and, and begin to talk about that. And then after that, come up with some solutions. So what can we do to fix this? And as you start coming up with solutions, this is what's going to happen. Your relationship, little by little, is going to improve. Right now, you're at a place of communication. If you keep working on your communication, a year from now, you're going to be in a better place. Two years from now, you're going to be in a better place. And then four years from now, you're just going to read each other's minds like, I already know what you're thinking. So already, me and Lisa, we just look at each other. We were like, okay, I know. <laughs> and she knows too. Okay, so begin to talk about that. Ask questions on your date night. And, and in the book, there's actually some, right. some, some books, some questions that you could ask to begin to spark conversation. So look at that book. It'll help you to spark some conversation as well. Okay? Awesome. Good job. Awesome. Thank you for those you're questions. You're doing it right now. You're, you're already way ahead of the game. That's even right. asking that question. That's right. Well, speaking of the book, um, if you have your book on you right now, I want you to go ahead and turn to page number two. And what we're going to do in this moment, if you're a married couple, we're going to go over the married commitment agreement. And if you did not get your book yet, um, you still have a chance to do that after service. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and read through this commitment together. And um, we're going to go and see what it looks like. And at the end, we're going to be able to sign this right now. So it says, we, and you'll put your names in, Christian and Yesenia, that's what we'll put, commit ourselves to invest in our marriage by coming together to do the following. Now, here are the seven things we're committing to. Number one, attend all sessions together as a couple. You made it to session number one. Give yourselves a round of applause. You got that one done. Number two, write down at least five positive things about my spouse and share them with each other during marriage and relationship challenge. Number three, have a date night once a week. Have go on a date once a week. Number four, this is a popular one. Have a time of intimacy at least once a week. Someone say, come on, somebody. There we go. For the married couples. If you're not married, don't say that. Number five. Number five, never go to bed angry and forgive one another. We're going to talk about forgiveness today, and we'll talk about it a little bit more next week. Number six. Complete all assignments in marriage and relationship challenge workbook. We went over it earlier today, but this work has a lot of great assignments for us. Number seven, invite one more couple to experience marriage challenge. How many know somebody that can benefit from this series? Let's invite them by next week. And at the end, it says this. As we invest in our marriage by attending all marriage and relationship challenge sessions, we will see God do the miraculous in our marriage. We will begin to experience companionship, unity, family life, and the fullness of God's blessings. If you're ready, married couple, to sign that right now. Get your pens out, sign now, and let's commit to it. And we know this, 
we can never succeed in an area that we are not committed to. If we want to see success, let's commit. Let's do it. All right, now we have a commitment agreement for? The singles dating and engaged. How many singles dating or engaged do we have in the place today? Awesome, awesome. You guys could be excited. Yeah, yeah. because there's somebody looking for somebody, so yeah. you could go ahead and say, uh, right. let them know, let them know. <laughs> Right. Okay. So this is just as important for you guys as it is for a married couple, right? So it's gonna, you're going to put your name right there. I state your name, commit myself to my future marriage by agreeing to do the following. Number one, attend all sessions together as a couple if you're dating or engaged. Number two, identify three attributes of a godly spouse that you want to cultivate in your life for your future marriage. Number three, maintain purity and integrity according to God's standards until married. Number four, this is for dating and engaged. Go on a date uh, once a week. Number five, complete all the homework assigned during marriage challenge. Number six, invite one more dating couple or single to experience the marriage challenge with you. And lastly, number seven, that you will attend the Ways courting classes when you begin dating and promise your future spouse to attend the Ways premarital classes when you become engaged. So those are definitely resources that you guys have available. And lastly, as you invest in your relationship growth now, you're planting seeds for your future marriage and expect all of your relationships while single, dating, engaged to be God-honoring, prosperous because of the investment made here at the Wayworld Outreach Marriage and Relationship Challenge. So you could go ahead and sign and date right there and we are going to get started. Come on. So I want us all to go ahead and stand up to our feet right now as we get ready for session number one. We're going to learn today about what it means to make a commitment. So let's give a big round of applause one more time to Pastor Marco, Pastor Lisa Garcia, and let's get started. Session number one. Let's get to it. Are you guys ready to learn? Someone say, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to learn. And so today we're going to be talking about commitment, and this is a reality. You'll never succeed in an area that you're not massively committed in. You'll never succeed in an area that you're not massively committed in. So we're going to talk about five, five areas that we're going to commit ourselves to in the next five weeks. And the purpose of making a commitment, this is a purpose, is, is, is so that when the emotions are gone, you could still continue moving forward doing what you committed to do. Commitment is not emotional. Commitment is a discipline. You're, make, you're giving your word to God is what's happening. You're giving your word to your spouse. You're giving your word to your future spouse. And this is what you're going to do. Whether you feel like it or not, you're going to learn how to just do what you've committed to do. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to start getting the results of the committed. How many want to get some success in your life? Okay, you may be seated. Yes. All right. So first, right off, we want to go over the word commitment. It means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you, right? Staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after that feeling, that mood that you set it in is left, it's gone, right? There's a quote and it says, there's a difference between interest and commitment. When you're interested in doing something, you do it only when it's convenient. When you're committed to doing something, you continue even when it's difficult. Say with me, I am, I am committed. And committed. that's why every marriage starts off with these real strong commitments for better, for worse, in sickness wow, and in health. Wow. And the reason is saying that because in every relationship, you'll have some good times and you'll have some bad times. There might be some sickness. There might be some losses. There might be some financial problems. And what's going to get you through that? The only thing that's going to get you through that is the commitment. Commitment. So let's talk about the five yep. commitments. All right. Commitment number one. You guys ready? Attend all sessions and do all the homework. That's a commitment. Attending all the sessions and doing all the homework. We can never succeed at anything we are not committed to. All right. So here's a success formula. Uh, write this down. Decide, make a, make a decision, commit, and then you succeed, right? First you decide, okay, I'm going to do that. 
then you commit, oh, I'm gonna do this, and then you, you can succeed. So that means any area that you decide to succeed in, you could succeed in if you're committed to it. Yes. We have too many people that are using the wrong lang language. We'll try, we'll see how it works. You'll never succeed at anything that you're trying or seeing how it works. Because, com because, because there's gonna be times that it's gonna look like it's not working. Mm. Just because it looks like it's not working doesn't mean that it's not gonna work. You gotta commit to it. I, let's just say this, you could go to trying to go to the gym for a week and that's gonna be great, but don't expect some massive improvements in one week. The only thing that might happen in the first week, you might experience a lot of pain. Sore. <laughs> now, if you're not committed, you're gonna say, this is ridiculous. I <laughs> still weigh the same, I still look the same, and all, all, all I added was pain? Commitment gets you through the pain to get you to the place of success. Does anybody want to succeed? You're going to have to get through some pain to get to the success story. Yes. So the undecided and the uncommitted are also unsuccessful. We will never receive anything from God, our efforts, when we are not committed. I like this scripture, and it's in James 1, 7. It says, if you are like that, unable to make up your mind and, and be undecided in all you do, you must not think that you will receive anything from God, from our Lord. That, isn't that amazing? If you are not decided, if you're undecided, you cannot be successful at anything that you ask because you're wavering. And you're, you, God says, don't even think that you're going to receive anything from me. Think about this. God does not help the uncommitted. Well, I need help. God says, until you get committed, I'm not giving you the resources. I'm not giving you the wisdom. I'm not giving you the help. For some of us today, until you get committed, you're not going to see any changes. Yeah. And you're scared. Oh, I'm right. so scared That's of commitment good. because I've been hurt so many times and I'm scared to do this again. And this is what God is saying. Be committed to what I've told you to be committed to. And I promise you this, I will help you succeed yes. in every area that you're committed to. Is there anybody that's ready to start getting success in their lives? And God has said, okay, I'm going to help you, but I need your commitment. So we're going to have in these next four weeks, we're going to have an opportunity to be committed. This is the first week. There's going to be week number two, week number three, and week number four. Your commitment will be tested circumstances will come up, you might feel a little tired, or maybe if you're married, you had a really tough week, and one of you just wants to quit. So forget it, it's not working. Remember, this is the first week at the gym. There's a lot of things that are gonna come up, and just because they're coming up doesn't mean that you're not growing. Before you start getting a breakthrough and you start seeing a great advancement, it usually seems like everything's falling apart. It's almost mm. like restoring a house. Wow. If you're buying a fixer-upper, you know what you do? First step, demolition. Wow. And there's some things that need to be like, okay, we have to tear this out. But at the end, if you stay here for the next four weeks, by the time you're done, I guarantee you this, your house will not look like it was when you first started. I want to take wow. a look at this picture. I'll see if they have it over here. Okay. When you start your marriage, this is what you start off with. Aww, wah, wah, wah. You get a fixer-upper. I know when you get married, you think you marry your, your Prince Charming, but the reality is you just married a fixer-upper. And it's the same thing with your wife. I know, I know she's beautiful. She looks so beautiful in that wedding dress, but she's still a fixer-upper. And the idea is what you put in is what you're going get, to get out. It's, it's an investment. Say, say with me. It's going to take some work. You work. And it's going to take some investment. An investment. But if you keep working at it, this is what's going to happen. You'll have this. Oh, You'll have a model home. Nice. Every person has potential. Every marriage yes. has potential so if you're true. willing to put the work in. Come on, just give praise for that because so it has potential. But you got to put the work in. Thank you, Lord. I would say this statement. The amount of effort you put in Will determine, it will determine how much you get out of it. What you put in will determine what you get out. Now, you might be saying, I don't want to do the homework. Well, that's the idea. What you put in 
is what you're going to get out of it. Mm. If you put in a little, look what the scripture says here. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, the man or woman who plants a little bit will get only a little bit from it. There's some of us today that are going to get massive amount of information today that's going to change your relationship, change your life. And that's the idea. You're putting in more. That means you're thinking about it. You're writing down notes and you're saying, no, I'm going to get this. Is there anybody here t- that today says, I'm going to get something out of this. I'm going to be transformed. Yes, that's so good. But it says this, the man who plants much will get much from it. It's very simple. What you put in is what you're going to get out of it. And if you do all the homework, you show for the four sessions and you, and, and you read the material and you go on the, and you follow the commitments, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get a lot from this and it will change your life, change yes. your family, change your future relationships. I'll even say this, it's going to change your children. Wow, that's so good. Let's go to commitment all number right. two. Number two, immediately, immediately apply everything that you learn. Only those who learn and apply will experience happy and successful marriages and relationships. Let's go to this scripture. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, but Jesus said, happy are those who hear God's word and obey it. So it's one thing to just hear God's word, but apply it, learn it to apply it, right? So we don't just learn, we don't, we're not here just to hear what God has to say and then kind of uh, weigh it out and say, mm, I don't know. No, when, when we hear God's word, it's our responsibility to immediately apply what he has spoken. Question, do you have married couples, do you have a happy marriage? Are you happily married or unhappily married? Mm-hmm. Now, if you, <laughs> so I'm happily married. Good job, guy. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> now, Now, if you're unhappily married, you don't need to change your spouse. All you need to do is do things differently. And this is what the scripture is saying. I'm going to show you how to have happy relationships, satisfied relationships. I'm going to show you how to overcome your obstacles, your challenges, and your difficulties. I'm going to teach you, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to apply it, and when I teach you and you apply it, it's going to lead to victory. It's going to lead to restoration. It's going to lead to transformation. It's going to lead to emotional healing. It's going to lead to happiness. Does anybody want happy relationships? You can have it if you hear it and you apply it. Hear it and what? Apply it. Apply it. We've been married now for 33 years. And I, I would say this, and I've said this year after year, I love my wife more than I did when we first got married. Well, how can you love her more? Because we've grown. Say it with me. We what? Grown. We're grown. We're hearing and applying. And if you're hearing and applying, this is good news. Your best days do not need to be behind you before you got married. Your best days can be in your future, but it's going to take some change. We're going to have to hear it and what? Apply it. Apply it. We're also going to have to like repent. That means I got to like change the way I'm talking, Mm. the way I'm living. And in these next four weeks, you're going to get a lot of instruction. And you know what that means? A lot of application. And you know what that means? A lot of change. And you know what that means? A lot of future happiness. Yes, definitely. I know I'm definitely a better version of me than when we first got married. So that's a plus, right? I don't know Learn what to say. Apply. You don't know what to say. You are too, though. Okay, if I say amen, you're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> no, we are. We no, are we are. We are. We're better. We're better. We're better. Successful marriages are built, right? right? They don't just happen. You got to work. Anything that that is worthwhile, you got to work at, right? There is always a path to success. All we have to do is follow it. There is is no luck in this. Marriages are built by learning and applying. Same thing. When you learn something, apply it. Learn it and apply it. The success principles and teaching of the word of God. This is where you learn the word of God. Now, um, the Bible is, if if it's an instruction manual for life, but I would even say this, what's even more, it's a relationship manual. Yeah. There's no one better than God when it comes to relationships. Jesus was here just three years of doing, he was was here 33 years, but he spent three years focusing on building relationships. And yet today we have 2.4 million, billion 
followers of Jesus Christ, that proclaim to be followers of Jesus Christ on earth today, that means his relationship principles are still winning people over. And if you begin to apply those same principles, this is what's going to happen. You'll begin to win people over. And the best place to start winning people over is right in your home. So look at this. And this is a promise in Matthew 7, 24. It says, anyone, say it with me. Anyone. What does that mean? Anyone. Anyone. Who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. A person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rains come in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. You know what that means? That every, every relationship will have problems, difficulties, storms. And this is the testing ground to see what you built it on. But if you've built your marriage on the principles of God by hearing it and applying it, this is what it's saying. Your marriage, your relationship will last. Yeah. It will last through the difficulties. And by the time you're done, you're going to be saying, we went through the sickness. We went through financial problems. We went through hurt. We went through betrayal. We went through difficulties. But we're still standing because we yes. chose to practice Commit. the principles of God. Is there anybody here Commit. that's more than a hearer? They're a doer and makes you wise. Yes, thank you, Lord. Okay. So commitment number three. Number three, forgive and forget the past. Forgive and forget is so important. We must all choose to forgive everyone for everything that they have ever done to us. We will not hold on to grudges. Uh, forgive means to let go, not talk or dwell on it any longer. No more, right? Let that not be part of your conversation anymore. Stop seeking revenge or payback. But in the end, you'll bless that person, right? Um, there's a quote here. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Wow. How do you know you haven't forgiven someone? your conversation is still stuck on something negative. Wow. Yeah. And when you, when, you, when you have unforgiveness, this is what it begins to do. It begins to trap you in a negative emotion. And not only trap you in a negative emotion, it begins to trap you in negative thinking. Mm. Uh, another way to say um, un, uh, or forgive or, or unforgiveness, you know you're not forgiven when you're keeping records of wrongs. Uh, that means you're, you're creating a list. Look what the Bible says about forgiveness. It says this. It says, love, the, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love keeps no record of being what? Wrong. Uh, love keeps no record of being wrong. And when we keep records of being wrong, we're not acting like God. We're acting like Satan. Wow. Because God is a forgiver and Satan is an accuser. Yeah. So you got to be careful that you're not becoming more satanic than godly. You guys get that? When I keep records of wrong, I'm becoming more like saint. Saint is an accuser of people. Yeah. And it's so easy to find faults in people. You know why? Because everyone has them. Everyone does. Are you going to be a fault finder or are you going to be a forgiver? But you can't be both at the same time. Wow. Say it with me. I'm a, I'm a forgiver. I'm a forgiver. I almost said I'm a fault finder. Some of you guys are saying that I am a fault finder. Uh, so forgiveness is a choice. Say with me, forgiveness is a what? A choice. I want to read this scripture. It's really important. I'm not matter of fact, you read it, honey. All Ephesians right. 4.31. Ephesians 4.31 and 32. It says, let, right there, first word, let. You got it. You have to let. Okay? It's up to you. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding and slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence, but be kind and helpful to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Let it go. Let it go. And either one list is dominated in your life or the other list. The first part is bitterness is dominated. Yeah. Uh, perpetual animosity is dominated. Resentment, mm. fault finding, slander. I've learned this about fault finding, unforgiveness, and, 
and bitterness. This is what it does. It blinds you. Say it with me. Wow. It blinds me. Blinds. What does it blind you? It blinds you to the good in your spouse. It also blinds you to what God is doing and what God can do. So the more unforgiven and bitter and resentful we come, become, the more hopeless we become and the more negative we become. And this is what happens. We, we get to the point that we cannot see anything good in anyone. Wow. We don't want to be that person. And it, it'll overflow into your church. It'll overflow into your workplace. It'll overflow in your kids. It'll just make you a complainer and a criticizer instead of an encourager and a lover. Does anybody want to be an encourager, uh, yes. a lover, and see good even when there's bad? We can do that, but you'll never do it if you're holding on to resentment and unforgiveness. Right. We can do it because he said we can do it right, right here. Let's go to commitment number All right. four. Number four. All right. It says... Commit to marriage vows. All right, so vows, the, how, many are, how many are married here in this place? How many? Raise your hand, raise your hand. All right, so all of you are married, and you took some vows at one point. And this is the thing about our vows. They're meant not to be broken, right? So there's a couple of things that we... Have n we don't ever say or mention, it's not even an option in our conversation or maybe a disagreement or an argument. It has never come up the option of saying separated or divorce. We don't use those words in the context of our marriage. It's really, it's not allowed. It's not an option because marriage is for a lifetime. My, my lifetime partner is... This man right here, right? All right, let's read um, right here. 1 Corinthians 7, 10, it says, Now I have a command for those who are married. Actually, it is not from me. It is what the Lord commanded. A wife should not leave her husband, but if a wife does leave, she should remain single or get back together with her husband. And a husband should not divorce his wife. Okay, so this scripture... Uh, I was looking at some stats about divorce, and this is what they said, is that before there's an actual divorce, that there's, there's, there's talk about divorce for two years. That means wow. that, that there was a checkout two years earlier, and this is the idea. If you're focused on separating and you're focusing on divorce, then that's where you're headed. Your language is really important. If you don't want it to be part of your marriage, then get, especially for those that are new, in marriage, you, you need to stop allowing that to be part of, as, as an option. There's no option for us to bring this up because that's not where we want to go. If you're here and your marriage is on the rocks, there's been a lot of checking out in the past. But it's not too late for you to check right in. And even if for four weeks you could say something like this, let's stop talking about divorce and separation for four weeks and let's focus on restoring, let's focus on changing, let's focus Good. on forgiving. And I'm gonna tell you this, if you're focusing on building, you're not gonna be focusing on destroying. But you can't be focused on two things at the same time. If you're focusing on your future, you're not focusing on your past, but you can't be focusing on your past and focus on your future. All we're saying for the next four weeks, let's practice this principle and say, well, we're planning to get divorce in a week. Put the paper aside. Let's work on it for the next four weeks and let's see what comes out of it as we work on it. And I'll guarantee you this. If you're applying the principles of God, by the end of the four weeks, you're going to think differently. You're going to feel differently. Yes. And your relationship is going to be transformed so because of what you've applied to your life. Yes, awesome. that's so true. And the last commitment, number five, is commit to following Jesus and this is so important. Everything we need to succeed in life and marriage comes after a commitment to follow Christ. And I could tell you that from when, when I did not know Christ as my Savior till when I do, when I have, it's made a complete difference. Um, I was one way, and then when I began to learn the Word of God and what His plan was for my life and what He says about me, what He says about everything it says it says that everything we need to succeed is in his word and it's total total transformation so following christ is going to be the most important thing first of all right off um second peter 
1, 3 says, Jesus has the power of God. His power has given us everything we need to live and to serve God. We have these things because we know him. Jesus called him by his glory and goodness. Awesome. So we receive everything that we need for relationships, for life, to succeed, to overcome. And this is why we can say this statement as believers. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. Can you get through it? Can you get through the difficult time? Can you get through the temptation? Can you overcome the betrayal? Can you forgive at the level you need to forgive? I know it's wow. very hard, but I do know this. It's always better to forgive than to hold on to bitterness. Because until yes. you forgive, you're trapped in a prison. Following Jesus is, is, is following him even as a single. I remember when me and Lisa were going out, we had a problem that we had to correct. And because I was following Jesus, this is what I did. I chose Jesus' way over my way. And this was a problem we had. I loved making out with her. <laughs> but the problem is when I was making, up, making out with her, I was not thinking about Jesus. <laughs> right? I, I was thinking about whole other stuff <laughs> that married people are supposed to think about. And I started realizing I, I would, I'd, I'd meet with, up with her and then we'd just make out. And I, and, I, and, I was, and I go, man, that's awesome. But and then the Holy Spirit says, that's my daughter. She's not your wife. That's my daughter. You're making out with her, feeling up on her. I'm talking about my kids aren't here, I don't think. <laughs> the Holy Spirit began to convict me, and he said, look, either you get this foundation right and you follow me, or you're going to set up a foundation for your marriage that you're going to have to reap the consequences of for when you're married, because what you don't overcome now, understand this, you don't overcome lust when you get married. You got to overcome that lust before you get married. So if I had a wife, I wouldn't wow. be lusting. Yes, you will. Hmm. So what I did was I told Lisa because I needed to be a leader. I, I, I want her to respect me and follow me. And I wanted to honor her as a woman of God. I'm, I put some, some boundaries. Also, I would not leave. I would never be at her house past 10 o'clock. Even though her parents lived at the house. As soon as it's 10 o'clock, I'll be jamming because I didn't want anyone to see my car in front of her house at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning because I guarantee you, they're not thinking they're having Bible study. <laughs> no, so true. I told her, I go, Lisa, we can't make out no more. <laughs> and she goes, okay. That was your idea, not mine. You're the spiritual leader, right? <laughs> so, and I told her, this is what we're going to do. No kissing. I could kiss you on the cheek. That's it. We could side hold hands once side, in a while. Side hug. Side hug, not straight up. <laughs> and I, I put these, and I goes, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be with each other for the, for the rest of our lives. But let's go ahead and follow Jesus in this so we can lay a good foundation. And we did that for a year, year and a half or so, preparing for our marriage. So what do we do? We did ministry together. We did Bible study together. We came to church together, but also we set a precedence in our marriage. And right now, if your marriage or your relationships have been all about lust, it, you, you got to turn that around because if you don't turn it around, it's going to be part of your future relationship. And what I wanted to do, see, fornication and lust and all that stuff while you're going out turns into adultery later. So if there's adultery there, we need to renounce that thing even right now and say, okay, and, and we need to forgive. So how many of we need to forgive? And then we need to start doing it God's way. And if you're saying, man, there's been a lot of betrayal, but maybe you need to look at what the foundation of the relationship was, and maybe it's been in the foundation, and this is a time for you to recognize we actually put that in our foundation. So let's go ahead and acknowledge that, forgive each other for our betrayal, and let's start over today. Yeah, How many are ready good. to start over today? We've all messed up. It's time to forgive. And if you just learned that, let's apply it. Yeah. Too. Be committed to that. Let's read the last point right here. Um, okay, so the only way to have a new marriage relationship is for us to become new people. 
God isn't interested in just changing our behavior. He wants to make us completely new. All right, 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone, are you an anyone? We are all anyone. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgiven and everything is new. So including your relationships, your marriage, your mindset, I am a new person. Say, I am a new person. If you're in Christ, you're a new person, right? All right. So uh, this is the idea. You'll never have a new relationship until you become a new person. That's true. I love this. I remember when, when I had a jealousy problem and it was really bad. There's some transformation that needed to happen in my life. And I, I was so jealous. I was very aggressive in my conversations and the way I acted. And my dad literally had a, a real bad jealousy problem before he died. Uh, he he would be so jealous that he would actually beat my mom, put guns to her head, and accuse her of things that he was basically doing, and it was very abusive. I, I saw that when I grew up, and I, and I said, I never wanna be that person, but I found myself that person. And what I needed to do at that point was acknowledge, Marco, you got a real serious problem. And, 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 it, it, and this is what the Holy Spirit told me. He goes, you understand? You're acting like she's not a transformed person. Don't you know that she is brand new? When I forgave her, I not only forgave her, I washed her completely of her past. You're yeah, acting like good. she's a person that's never been made brand new. I've got some good news for you. I don't care how bad things have been in the past. You could become a brand new yes. person today. Yes. Your husband can become a brand new person today. Your wife can become a brand new person today. And you know what that means? You could have a brand new relationship. Yes. Does anybody want some newness? Come on, some That's newness. Good. And that means we're gonna, I accept you as my new, pers new person. And I, I went to Lisa and I go, Lisa, I am so sorry for accusing you of your past. You're not that person anymore. And I and ask you to forgive me. And I accept you as a woman of God that you are. And from now on, I will treat you who you are in God's eyes. I love you. Right. And that was a decision I had to make. You guys understand that. Is anybody ready to start brand new today? Come on, start brand new. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a few things that we could apply. Number one, if you need to forgive someone, it's time to forgive. When's the right time to forgive? Now. Well, I don't feel like it, remember? Forgiveness is a choice, choice is not a feeling. Uh, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. This is what forgiveness is. Forgiven the inexcusable because God forgave you of the inexcusable. And when you do that, you could actually start over. Today's your day to start over. Wouldn't it be great to leave the past behind here and you could walk out now with all that burden, all that hate, all that anger, and all of forgiveness? And you would do it because you're trusting God. Say, so God, if I do it your way, will it work? And God says, Yeah, try it my way. You're not putting your trust in the person, you're putting your trust in the Lord. You might think, if I forgive them, I'm letting them know it's okay. God says, no, no, you're forgiving them because I'm giving you instructions and I, t I guarantee you this, if you do it my way, you will succeed. Your life won't collapse. It's gonna be built up. Does anybody wanna start building the right relationship? But you can't build on a wrong foundation of unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment. Is, is there anybody here that needs to forgive someone? Raise your hand real quick. Is there anybody here that needs to forgive your spouse? They might not even be in this room today. They might, but they might be in there, might not. Anybody needs to forgive your spouse? Okay, it's something wrong with that. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's the beginning of God beginning to work for you. Because until you forgive them, God can't even touch them. God is saying, let me have them. Let go of it. Let me touch them. And God will touch them. The other thing, is there anybody here that you're tired of doing it your way. And you're saying, I've been doing life my way. I wanna do it God's way and I want God to forgive me. Because the beginning of a turnaround is you becoming a brand new person. You know how you come to, you know how you come to God? You come the way you are. You come with your bitterness, your anger, the, the failures, we've all failed. There's nobody here that doesn't need forgiveness. Somebody understand that? And when you marry someone, you're gonna have to practice forgiving. You're gonna have to become a forgiveness master. Because every person that you're, every person that you'll ever be in relationship with, 
or you're going to have, uh, you're going to be married to, will need a lot of forgiveness on their account. And that's why the Bible says, make an allowance for each other's what? Faults. Everyone has faults. If, there's, if you need to f receive forgiveness, say it with me, for receive forgiveness. And, and begin to say, I, I want to make my decision today that I not only want to receive forgiveness, I want to be empowered to live a new life. It's amazing what God will do. You come the way you are with your pain, your hurt, your addictions, your letdowns, the betrayal, the abuse you've gone through. And you're saying, God, I'm done following my pain, my hurt, my ways. Lord, I want to follow you. And this, I'll guarantee you this. If you follow him, he'll lead you to victory. He'll lead you to happiness. He'll lead you to, come on, he'll lead you to satisfaction. Right now is your choice. Follow Jesus. So those that need to forgive someone, raise your hand again. Stand up where you're at real quick. Just stand up real quick, real quick. Stand up where you're at. Okay. I need to forgive someone. Just stand up real quick. The devil hates this part. The devil hates it because when you're ready to forgive, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be forgiven. Okay. If there's any couples right now that you're struggling, stand up. You're struggling. It's okay. Everybody knows you're struggling already. It's okay. Your kids know. Everybody knows. Just stand up. Oh, I don't want nobody to know. Everybody knows already. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with struggling. There is a problem. Is remaining in the struggle and do nothing about it. How many of you know this is war? If you could stand up here, you could begin to stand up out there. Anybody else? One more group. I need to receive forgiveness. I like, I need, forgive me, Lord. I've been holding on to resentment. I've been holding on to bitterness. I've been holding on to anger. Forgive me, Lord. I've been doing life my way. No wonder it's not working. If you need forgiveness, just stand up. You want, you make, you want to make a decision to follow Jesus. Proud of you. Proud of you. Come on. We got some young men, young ladies. That's awesome. I love it. I want, I want everybody to stand up with them. And those that stood up, come up here real quick. Because I want to, me and Lisa want to pray with you. You stood up for any one of them. I want forgiveness. I need to forgive. We, I mean, we're struggling. It's okay. We're going to ask God for some help. And he's going to give you all the power that you need to do this. It's going to be the beginning of your new life. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Come on, church. We're believing that right now, as, as you're making these choices, even as you're, if you're a single, you might need to forgive your mother. You might need to forgive your father. And God has said, until you get that right, I can't even release somebody to you because there's a problem. You're going to hurt them. I need you to heal you so you don't hurt them, so you can love them. Come on, we're still coming forward. Let's, let's press in a little further this way. I'm proud of every one of you. If your husband or wife's not here, don't worry about it. You're one already. What happens to you is going to happen to him or happen to her. Okay. Are you ready? Come on, they're still coming. Let's give it a little second. Just come on. Let's make a little more room. Let's push in just a little bit more here. Church, are we committed? Come on, just four, three more weeks. How many more weeks? Come on, three weeks. Come on. You used to go to the, you used to go to the casino three weeks in a row. You used to go to the bar three weeks in a row. You used to go to your drug dealer three weeks in a row. Come on. You used to go to the baseball game three weeks in a row. Let's show up to church three weeks. I guarantee your life's going to be transformed. We love you. You know, when, when I, when I, me and Lisa spent some time, you know, just coming up with this lesson. And no matter how much we deliver it, we feel like we have done better. And I'll tell you why. It's not because we want to we wanna just do it better for the sake of doing it better. We just want to make sure that we're as impactful that we can be. We love you. And, and our reward, and this is what we've given our lives for, is see your lives transformed to what it's supposed to be. If you're depressed and you're angry and you're upset and you're full of unforgiveness and, you, and your relationships are full of misery, it's never been God's will. And I wish I could be coaching with you like walking with you all day long, say, hey, no, no, let's do it this way. Oh, this is better. Oh, that was awesome. I would love to be able to coach you that way, but I got some good news for you. Right now, when you receive forgiveness and give forgiveness, the Holy Spirit yes. is going to be coaching you from here on out. Gonna, I can't be there, but the Holy Spirit's going to be there. And he's going to say, hey, 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 hey. Lower that voice a little bit. Right? And then you're going to like, wow, I never heard that. Huh? And that's God's Spirit. You're going to hear God's voice. You say, I never heard God's voice. Yes, you have. Why are you up here? 
I guarantee you, if someone would have told you, you know, you're going to go up there before server said, like, oh, go up there. Ain't nobody tell me what to do. <laughs> but, but something happened. Well, you started hearing this. You said, wait a second. You started self-reflecting. He said, oh, I need to forgive. Or I need to receive forgiveness. Or I need to start loving. Or I need to start doing it God's way. I've been doing it my way. No wonder I've been so miserable. Okay. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to receive forgiveness. And we're going to what? Give it. We're going to receive it and what? Give it. Give it. Okay. And how many times you should forgive? Just keep. Say, say with me. I'm a forgiver. That's it. Uh, say this. I am not a fault finder. Because you're going to be one or the other. And if you're a fault finder, I know this. You're going to be miserable. Because the problem is when you're a fault finder, not only do you find fault in everybody, like no one's like, all you all hypocrites. But this is how you start thinking about yourself. You start thinking, I'm not worth anything either. And you start pointing all your faults. Some of you right now, needs to break up with the devil that's been accusing you and allowing you to, and using you to be an accuser and end that relationship. Because it doesn't even allow you to celebrate you're here today. You're making some right decisions. You're not all bad. Come on. You're valuable. God loves you. You got to be able to accept that. Someone say, I accept God's love. Are you ready to do it God's way? Okay. Now, someone might ask you for forgiveness right now. Just forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, it's only going to get worse. Let it go. Well, I'll forgive them when they deserve it. I'm telling you, they never will deserve it. It's just going to get worse. If you think it's bad now, hold on to unforgiveness. See how bad it gets. Because you know what's happening when you have unforgiveness? Satan is your pastor. It just rules your life. When you forgive, Jesus is your pastor. And leads to everlasting life. Okay, are you ready? Um, couples, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a second. If right now you need to forgive each other, um, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer first. And, and, and couples right now, because I wanna just get into all this what we need to pray for. But if you right now you need to forgive your spouse, I want you to look at your spouse right now and look them in the eye. Please, please, you can continue playing music, but um, and I want you to say, I, if you need to ask forgiveness, say, I forgive me for, and say what it is, and let's end it. And then when your spouse asks you to forgive them, this is what you need to do. I forgive you. Say it with me. I forgive you. So let's take just one, just 30 seconds right now and just say it. I, forgive me for, and just say it really quick. It doesn't need to be a long, exasperated conversation. But we're going to allow the Holy Spirit right now to work on your heart. The, a miracle is happening right now. And as you're saying this, the devil is being kicked out of your mind, out of your family, out of your, out of your emotions right now. There it goes. It's happening right now. It's happening right now. We come against every spirit of unforgiveness, bitterness, spiritual blindness, criticism, anger, slander. We break it now. Shame is broken now in the name of Jesus. All right. Awesome. All right. Forgiveness. Receive it. Okay. Repeat after me, everyone. Say, Jesus, I ask you now to forgive me of all my sins. I make a choice today. I make a commitment to follow you for the rest of my life. Save me. Make me into a new person. And I choose right now to forgive everyone that has hurt me. I even receive forgiveness for my own sins and I forgive myself. I let go of all bitterness, anger, resentment, payback. It's done. Fill me now with your love from this day forward. I am a committed follower of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that I'm able now, through your spirit, to love everyone, including enemies. I pray a blessing over everyone that has hurt me. 
touch them just like you touched me. Save them just like you saved me. From today on, my life is changing. I am building a great life and I will have, and I have a bright future. I receive joy. I receive happiness. Every day as I follow your ways, I'll become wiser, happier, stronger, and more victorious. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. If you said that prayer and you meant it, you're forgiven. Brand new start. I am so, so, so proud of you. You could go ahead and tell them about that. Oh, right, right, yeah. But we love you. If you need prayer, just stay right. We'd love to pray with you. And, and make sure you get your manual. There's only a limited amount out there. Get it. Invest in it. Get that manual. It's an everyday homework. You don't want to miss it. Has all kinds of instructions in that book. And it's going to be a manual that you can teach others, master it, and it's going to lead you to transformation. It's not a four-day challenge. It's a 30-day challenge. Come next week. It's going to be awesome. We're going to be here praying for you guys. We love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. And our cafe is open if you want to just stop by there and just hang out and get some lunch. Love you guys.